started. Hi everyone. Today is uh, for today's agenda. The first thing, first and foremost thing, is uh, the design discussion for authentication. So we have to discuss two things. The first is what information do we need to send to other plugins to um, to create uh, an authenticated client connection, and the second is to which plugins do we send that information to? Because last in the last meeting we uh, we had a discussion that we could uh, delegate the responsibility of uh, getting the size of repository from the brand source plugins to the um, uh, to their base plugins if they could be called base plugins, the GitHub plugin or the GitLab plugin. So. Um, so while looking at the brand source plugins, I have uh, seen that. So with the GitHub brand source plugin, I, I saw something which which kind of um, helped me in generalizing how we could send the information to each plugin. So um, usually in the brand source plugins, the SCM source, what it does is when it needs the credentials, it looks for a class and uh, for an example, uh, the GitHub um, uh, Brand source would look for a username credentials class, username password credentials class. The GitLab uh, brand source would look for a personal access token uh, type of class. And then the context. So we need three things for authentication. First is the um, the type of credential we need. Second is the context from where we need it. And the third is the credentials ID, which could be mapped to the credential store. So. So the second thing, which is the context. So these brand source plugins, what they do is they get the owner of the SCM source, which is logical for them because they are brand source plugins. So they would get, get that context and then find the credentials for, um, for that particular context. But what we need is we, we need to pass our own context because for an example, a freestyle job will not be aware of any uh, multi-branch project. So we need to pass our own context and we need these plugins to understand that and to take that in account and then find the credentials. So the GitHub uh, branch source plugin already has a static method. So, so the GitLab and uh, so the GitLab branch source plugin did not have a static um, method to look for the credentials. It was, it was connected, it was uh, linked to the instance of this uh, SCM, Git SCM source. So my extensions, the extensions we uh, implement are static. So there was no way I could borrow those credentials, which it searches in the SCM source uh, owner. It searches in the owner's context and then get them into our, uh, con into our extension. And that would, I think would not be correct as well. So, so what I've done is I've done something similar. Uh, I borrowed what uh, the GitHub branch source does. It provides a general method where you provide me uh, so that that, met, that function asks for three things. It asks for um, the context. It asks for the, um, uh, I will show you through the code only. So it asks for the context and, in, and then it asks for the URL uh, where, for which we are asking this. It could be, it, it is generally the API URL. And third is the credentials ID. So, um, so I've done something similar for the GitLab plugin. Instead of uh, taking the owner, owners, con the SCM source owners context, I have, uh, I, uh, I've provided, I've, uh, I, I've asked it to ask for the context. So it, 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 it is generalized, and then it would, um, so it would then look, go and look for. Um, the, the personal so so if a if a person is uh, entering a GitLab URL uh, in the Git plugin, it would provide the credentials a uh, personal access token, and that token then can be accessed by the GitLab branch source plugin, and then that would be used to um, to create uh, an authenticated connection with uh, the client API, and that's how yes yes ma'am. So, so you said you'll use a personal access token, but doesn't that then preclude doing anything with a, a, a GitLab URL that uses SSH? Because in that case, it only has a, a private key credential. I mean, I, that's okay. It just, so this, this, the technique you're describing will work great for um, HTTP based Git URLs, 
but not mm -hmm. for SSH based URLs. Yes, it would not. Work. It would not okay. work for that. But then, but then, um, what I want, want, I would see is that. So I, I, I look at how uh, the, um, the the current branch source plugins are taking the credentials, and and if we look at the default credentials method to get the credentials for the GitLab um, branch source, they they are asking for the personal access token only. Mm -hmm. And not for for so what you're saying is if we have uh, that, so the SSH uh, URL we would have that if we have a personal server where we uh, where we have uh, a GitLab server hosted right and then we would want to connect to that server using SSH or in in any uh, case we would have a server where we would establish a SSH connection and we would need a private key to do so. Okay, so. Well, but but it's perfectly okay that the, the SSH case needs special thought. That's, that's perfectly fine. Solving the HTTPS case is already great. Yes, and, and, and uh, why I did not think about it is, uh, is that I, whenever I, I look at how this has to be done, I look, at the, I look at the current way the brand source plugin is handling credentials, and that is why I, I just shadow the, just the same process. And I did not think about uh, the SSH service, but yes, uh, that's definitely a case we would have to. Well, and, and there's, there's no choice there because there isn't a way to do a REST API call with an SSH token, with an SSH yes, private that's... key. There just isn't. It can't be done. Uh, You'd have to like find a way to translate the URL to HTTPS, but for custom URLs, you're kind of sunk. I think. Right. Exactly. Like you could maybe do it for gitlab.com, uh, but like if it's blah, 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 dot com. <laughs> like, right. what am I going to do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so now with this implementation, what has happened is that we can be sure that we need for in, if you talk about the Git plugin, we do not need to send any other information to the plugins. I was also looking at the Gitty brand source plugin. Um, I haven't looked too much into it, but I, 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 as much as I was looking at how they're authenticating the connection, it's the same process. Uh, they are also uh, in the branch source, in the SEM source class, they are trying to get the owner's context and then, um, and then it is trying to create a connection. So, so now my, uh, so now we had two points to discuss. The first was what information we need to send in to which plugins. So now the second, uh, decision to which plugins should we delegate this responsibility depends on so do we want to implement a, a general method here so the github brand source plugin does implement a method where it is asking for the context and uh, but it is perfectly fine for the branch source plugins to to say that i don't want to ask for the context i know that i am going to be uh, i am running in a scm source environment so i would get the scm source owner's context and i would need that to provide the credentials I do not need to provide a general method to get those credentials. So should we shift this implementation, the responsibility to the GitLab plugin so that, that the GitLab plugin would be a, a plugin which would not be limited to a, a, a multi-branch project, right? It could, it could have uh, endpoints which could be accessed by other plugins and it does not have it does not have the sole responsibility of working for a multi-branch project. That is what I'm saying. So programmatically or technically, it doesn't matter to us if we are putting this implementation to uh, the branch source plugin or to that plugin, to the GitLab or GitHub plugin, because um, one way or the other, we would have both of them installed. If the branch source plugin is installed, we would have the other one. But yes, uh, the vice versa would not work. We could have the GitHub plugin, but we would not have the GitHub branch source plugin. But I'm I'm not personally aware of of the use cases of the GitHub plugin and the GitLab plugin. So that's something um, uh, maybe you could uh, tell me if there's there are use cases. So so the decision rests on this uh, fact that we could. Uh, we could uh, create a method which would just take the, we just need the uh, branch source plugins to take our context and then look for the credentials because we will provide the credentials from our context because we would have the user 
who would choose the credentials and then only would access a private repository or GitLab repository or a GitHub repository. So, so we need that from the from any plugin. So, uh, since the GitHub branch source plugin is already it has that method, and I I exactly did the same for the GitLab. I I haven't tested it because I'm having some issues. I want to discuss later, but uh, but it it's the same. It's uh, line by line the same thing we're doing for the GitLab <coughs> branch source plugin, and it should work. But um, so the decision rests there. Should we move this implementation to the to those plugins, or is it okay for us to um, uh, keep this in the branch source plugin? So it it would be only I think one case where we need to uh, we need to see is that so the Git for for the Git plugin it it doesn't matter if the plugin from where we are asking this information. If it so, if a, a branch source plugin would have multiple repositories mapped to a single owner, Git plugin would, I, I as far as I know, would have one one owner, one repository, right? If you're talking about a project, so that might that we might think that that might be uh, something which might create an issue. But since we are providing our own context and we know that the, the branch source plugin would be would take the credentials from our context we just need the the functionality of that plugin to be able to connect with the client server client api server. we need that the credentials the, the the mechanism to scan the credentials is pretty much same in the git plugin or the github branch source plugin or the gitlab branch source plugin as well, is what i saw the the way it scans the credentials and uh, the type of credential it looks depends on the branch source plugin but the the, the way they are scanning uh, for the credentials is same. So, so for us, as far as I uh, I understand, it's it doesn't matter to us if it's implemented in a branch source plugin or uh, or down below to the GitHub plugin or the Git uh, GitLab plugin. So, um, so yes. So I think um, what we need is first. Uh, definitely interactive testing um, because uh, so I have I've been facing some dependency issues because of which I was not able to upload uh, the GitLab branch source plugin to the same Jenkins instance where the latest version of my Git plugin is installed. Uh, I, I before going moving to that point, is there any um, any concern, any doubt, or any um, anything we would want to discuss? I'm I'm not concerned about whichever path you choose. So I think if if it's if it feels simpler and more elegant to you to do it one way versus the other, that that way is great. Um, the Giddy plugin for me has been is the closest to a clean room implementation, and I think you said it does not contain this needed function, right? It, it doesn't have it. Yes, and um, so. Uh, uh, just one second, Mark. Uh, I have looked at the SCM source class. So usually, when I'm looking at a branch source plugin, I always go at the SCM source class, and then that is the point where I understand how the client is being created, what it needs, and, and I do the same thing. Now, I haven't looked at the other classes where uh, the Giddy plugin might be using uh, a credentials function where it, it's taking the context and doing that. I haven't looked at that. I will, my observation is just limited to the uh, to the Git SCM source class. So would it and would it which of the which of the two alternatives would make it easier for you? Is it indifferent to you which which way you go, or is there one that oh this would be easier if I did it this way? If if all the plugins looked like GitHub branch source, would that be easier, or is it rather some other way? I, for me, it it doesn't make a difference. Till the point I so for so it's different for each plugin. For for an example, for GitLab branch source, it doesn't matter if it's the GitLab branch source or the GitLab plugin because the way I am creating the client, it's it's I'm directly I'm not using any wrapper method provided by the branch source plugin. I'm using directly the Java implementation and instantiating the client like that. But when we talk about the GitHub branch source plugin, 
they have provided a common utility class of a connector class where it, it takes some um, it takes the repository url it takes some information it takes the credentials and does all the work for us so so maybe it's for us it i am not sure if it matters if we're uh, if you're finding a, a standard common uh, decision that okay we if we implement this extension we are going to implement this extension at all branch source plugins only or if you're not doing that then we're doing it for the uh, independent github plugin or the gitlab and so on maybe we could uh, look at cases if for example in the github branch source it's what i have already done it i have tested it inside my local instance with the private uh, credent with the credentials and private uh, um, repository it, it is working it's getting the size uh, and as far as i'm concerned i think i need the size and i'm getting it so i i'm not sure if it matters too much what plugin we are using so um, maybe we need to look at that from the perspective of so it doesn't even matter if we have a multi branch project or not because so that dependency is also uh, uh, is not there because these methods do not require the context of the branch source plugin it it requires a context which we would provide so we just need a git a git plugin uh, a, a pipeline which is um, trying to use git as the scm and then doing whatever it wants to so so it so i i think it would not matter to us if it's a branch source plugin or a normal plugin. That's what, what are you I, using the item context for? Uh, that is case? what I I will show you exactly. I thought that how. was used to pass the credentials in, right? That that's that's how you were relying on them to to get the credentials for that oh. job, right? Okay. Yes. So the lookup credentials, which is probably the credentials API, it takes uh, three things from us. It takes the type of credentials we need. It takes the context, okay. and and then it takes the URL they provide URI, and uh, then we match it. Uh, we match and those credentials the, with the. Uh, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, and you said the, uh, the GitLab branch source plugin, not the GitLab plugin, is where this is your convenience method is, right? I mean, I yes. see here it's where you've written this one, but. Did you say there was a, a pre-existing one? Or you're talking about this one online site, 751? 751 is the pre-existing uh, method which is provided in the, uh, which is in the GitLab branch source plugin, how it takes the credentials. So if we, if we, if we, if we see, it's, it's getting the SEM owner context here. Instead of doing that, I am providing it the context and I, I, I add this context here. That's, that's just what I've done. And the rest of the, um, the the way of looking at credentials, it remains the same. So, yeah. yes. So, so this this method can be static. This can be static because it is not connected to any instance of the current class where it is entered. This is the SEM source class. It doesn't matter if we are using a SEM source object or not. But for this way of taking the credentials, it would matter because we are trying to get the SEM owner. So we, this is not static. So we cannot use this method to pass down the credentials to the extension class, extension implementation. Yeah, so this, what you're doing seems quite reasonable to me. You're saying, hey, in the case of GitLab SCM source, I need to ask a question. What are What is the personal access token associated with this context so that I can, I can use it? And OK, yes. now you indicated that you could choose to put this instead in the GitLab plugin. Was that that? Uh Yes, we could do that because we need two things to implement these methods, my ex the extension and this method, the credentials API and um, the GitHub lab, the GitHub API, GitLab API, uh, wrapper, for Java uh, 
that way. So we would know, know uh, we would need those two things, and we would have that in inside DK Flat Flat. So we can implement the same thing in that plugin as well. But there is, but, but there isn't an obvious place in the GitLab plugin where this would naturally insert, whereas the SCM source, it's a natural location to insert it. That's where the GitHub branch source has it, right? GitHub branch source already provides this at this layer. Uh, the GitHub branch source plugin has, um, so it, it, it contains these, uh, the scanning credentials method inside the general connector class, the utility class I was talking about. Right. And it, it borders, borders it in the SCM source or wherever it wants to. That is how it is working. Yeah, so the concept of a connector is at the branch source level in the GitHub branch source plugin. That seems like a, a fair justification, same doing the same way, following the same pattern, putting it in the GitLab branch source. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, yes, that is what I'm talking. Yeah. And you're you're planning on using this when they set up the freestyle project or at runtime? So when, like when, it, when it builds running, it has to be at runtime because it's used yes, for it the has to repository be. size calculation. Exactly. Right? Yes. And, and I think this use case is when people are setting up a branch source plugin. I think this is used for jelly. Is it? So I, th I, I thought that this was can would then be used. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I think the I think what happens is at runtime, what, um, this is used uh, to produce the output for the the UI, and then the user selects the credential they'd like to use. It finds the the candidates, and then it uh, present the UI presents the credentials that the user can use. The user selects the credential, and then they save it. And then inside of the config XML of the of each underlying job in in a branch source setup, uh, you'll see a credentials ID uh, stored and persisted. So Justin, is that is that are you are you considering then that should we store the credentials ID as part uh, somehow as part of the 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 question to ask for the size of a repository. I, I'm not sure I'm understanding sh how we, how would we use the the information you've shared. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if. Well, I have a couple of questions about it. One at runtime, like, are we potentially going to expose credentials we shouldn't uh, if we detect the wrong credential that a user doesn't want to expose. Um, which that's a hard problem from usability perspective. I think that's hinting at the first question that you're asking is like, um, are we going to make people select which credential they want for size calculation? I think that's kind of your question, right? Well, so the, the way Rishab has implemented it, as far as I understood it, it's the, the job has a repository defined for it. And that repository has a credential associated. And he's yes. relying on the called on GitHub when he calls into the GitHub branch source, it will using that job, it will find the credential ID for that job and use it. So so I don't think there's any leakage because the credential ID is absolutely associated with a specific job. Did I understand correctly, Rishab, or correct me? Yes. So so if if I am uh, if I am creating a freestyle job uh, and if I choose to check out the SCM using Git. Uh, via a GitLab private rep uh, repository. So with the repository, I would add credentials for that repository to do the process, to do the, the thing, uh, to, to check out. And that, those credentials would be the personal access token in, in, in case of GitLab, those would be the personal access token type of credentials I'm choosing. And then, so I, now the Git plugin would have the, the um, would connect the, these credentials with the repository, user repository information we have, and then we could send the credentials ID of the particular job and the context of the job to this extension, uh, which lives in the branch source plugin. And then the branch source plugin would use the job's context 
and the credentials ID we've provided to, to get us the credentials. Yes, that's, that's how I have. Uh, I see. So it's only scanning credentials associated directly with that freestyle project. Yes, yes, Justin. Okay. I'm less in the freestyle project mode, so that's where my questions are coming from too, probably. <laughs> and, um, so, so now I'm. I, one question I'm wondering at is, if if this is this function of scanning credentials is independent, it looks like it can be implemented anywhere because it just needs the context, it needs the URL, and then it's need the credential. But then, okay, we need the information for the client, API client, and that we can find only uh, either in the branch source plugins or the, uh, the GitHub plugin or the GitLab plugin. So never mind, I was just, hmm, okay. So uh, for, for, for me, I need to, uh, the GitHub branch source plugin extension, I have interactively tested it and confirmed that it's working. But with the GitLab one, I have I've not been able to. So I would, so if we don't have any question, if there's no concern right now, I would like, I would like to ask the question related to the dependency issue. So, so in the Git plugin, we uh, we depend on the Git line plugin, of course. And so, since the unsupported command is is shipped in the latest release, Mark, I assume that the Git the Git plugin would depend on the latest Git client plugin now. Not yet. You'll have to explicitly declare that. And you do that okay. here by inserting a line version. Version, yes. Right. Yeah. So, and the, mm. the technique that's being used here is this particular file is using the Jenkins plugin bill of materials. Mm. And the Jenkins plugin bill of materials provides a default Git client value that was verified. Okay. And that default value is lower than the one you need. So you'll need to declare. Okay. You'll need to declare the version mm. number explicitly there. Then mm. um, three months or six months from now, when the bill of materials is updated, we'll be able to remove <laughs> the version declaration again. Okay. Yes. Okay, so. Sorry for the confusing nature yeah, of, of Maven management. That's okay. So currently in the uh, pull request, I did add the version because without that, my test would fail. Mm -hmm. But uh, but now when I was trying to so I so the GitLab branch source plugin is directly depending on the Git plugin. It has added it as a dependency in its form. But my uh, the issue comes when I'm trying to um, so I'm I'm again uh, having um, the Maven Enforcer plugin upper dependency uh, issues while doing so and. Uh, so what I did was I just excluded all of the uh, dependencies which are creating those upper dependency issues. I'm not sure if that's the right way to do it, but um, so wherever I was finding a conflict uh, in versions, I was just excluding them, which uh, the Git, the latest Git plugin would have different versions and what the GitLab branch source plugin uh, needs are different. So it's different. So that was creating an issue. So I would, I would expect that those, ex well, I don't know, I, that may need some further investigation because those exclusions. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I always have to work through very painfully these Maven enforcer enforcer issues. So mm. I'm a little surprised at those exclusions, but if d does it run for you okay when you attempt to load this in at runtime? Uh, no, it does not. I'm still having enforcer issues. I am having it for the Git client. So if if you, I I never understand this line. I always take it as as a conflict and I try to exclude it. I I don't understand this line. What does this mean? I understand that we have two versions of the same plugin and that is why we need to remove one. Is is that so? Is this what this line means that it says it requires upper bound dependencies for the Git client and it's creating the 3.2.1 version and I am getting the 3.4.1 version. The Git plugin has declared the 
uh, one version. So I uh, so initially I thought since the only since since the GitLab branch source is depending on the Git plugin, it would get the Git client plugin from the Git plugin itself. So right. why would it create a conflict? I I could not understand. Something else is probably also declaring it. Well, except that, that in that this, case, but. the the report here is actually saying that GitLab branch source depends on Git plugin four point three point one dash snapshot, which depends mm -hmm. on Git client three dot two dot one. I would have interpreted that to mean that somehow your four three one snapshot is inadvertently declaring that it needs three point two point one. Uh, that surprises me though, because you'd said it doesn't doesn't even compile for you if you don't depend on 3.4, at least 3.4.0, right? Yes, yes. It will not compile. So I would need that. Okay, I, I think I, I can look at the dependency tree and maybe I should um, work out my day like that. I was just, um, so that's how I, so what I need to do right now is to, uh, to add this updated Ram source instance in uh, this plugin in my Jenkins instance, and then I would uh, test it for a, a GitLab repo in a freestyle project. So I so I will I will try to solve this, and uh, I think after that. So again, uh, uh, in the last meeting we had the conversation that uh, the GitLab requires a server name instead of the URL. And the plan source plugin uh, by default does not provide us a method to um, to directly use the server URL to get the client. But uh, I was able to look at the uh, Java API uh, implementation. And there was a way, and I implemented that in, in, in our extension. So that's solved. Also, I uh, using curl requests. I uh, so we also I I, I I I had an issue in the last meeting that. The size of the repository comes under uh, statistics for a project, and you and in the documentation it said it said that uh, um, we need particular access. To, a user would need access to a particular access to that project to get those statistics. Uh, I was able to get uh, the statistics for a private GitLab repo for which I have developer access to. Uh, so I I am assuming that it would work for us in general cases for anyone, uh, not just the owner. I had the issue that it might only, we might only be able to get the statistics for the owner of the repository of the project. That's not, uh, that's not true. So, yes. So now the steps I need to implement, first of all, the current PR, the 931 now, it has the unsupported command work, all of that I shifted from PR 937 to 931. So now in, in 9.31, the Git tool chooser is being instantiated in the Git SCM. Uh, in, in the Git SCM, in, in the, in particularly in the method which is creating the client. So if someone wants to run the plugin, it should, there should be, they will be able to test the Git tool chooser with, with simple checking out uh, the, a repository, a freestyle job in any way. I, what I need to do is I need to add it at other places where the client is being created as well, in the, particularly in the SCM source. I haven't done that there. So for me, that's one commit I have to uh, add. And the second then would be once uh, we have covered all the places where the Git tool chooser is being instantiated to add uh, uh, a similar safety switch in the globals configuration page like we added for uh, the redundant fetch issue. So then the user would have the ability to um, not use the git tool chooser. So that's something I still have to do. So do these two things I, are missing for, from that PR, but I, I think uh, in, in terms of git tool chooser, it's, uh, the design and its function, the, the function it, it, it should provide, it is it is doing that. Um, then there's one more discussion which we haven't discussed, I, uh, which was related to what the Git tool chooser is returning. Currently, it is returning a string, which is the 
uh, the git executables path which is directly feeded to the the, the builder of the client uh, justin and fran have uh, have recommended or uh, they've uh, they've they've said that we could instead of using uh, passing a string and if in case we're not able to recommend anything i i the git to chooser sends none and then i would i have to add another check after that so if the recommendation is none then don't use the recommendation use what was uh, given by the system provided by the system the git plugin uh, the git plugins uh, recommendation so um, instead of that we could use the git tool we could return a git tool so i do i do not understand the use case of doing because so if let's just go where the git tool chooser is being called i and i will we'll see how the result is being used so so this is the pr931 code so the chooser is being called and the chooser's tool which is the executable string is is then directly added here so if we if we return the git tool git tool instead of a string then we would it's i think it's it's the same thing we would have to then get the um, executable from the git tool it would store that i i guess the only advantage where we use a git tool is that the that for the cases where we are not recommending anything the git tool would go to the default installation but then that would be a concern for us might be a concern for us because git tool then would make another decision which we do not want to make if we're using the git tool because we have to consider before changing what kind of implementation we can suggest we need to consider what the system and the user has um selected the git tool chooser is now equipped to look at those decisions and then provide uh, the result but if i if i instantiate a git tool and i i i add the uh, recommendation we want to give uh, to the git tool and then we we return the git tool in case we are not providing any implementation the git tool would default to the uh, default installation that's right uh, right i think so and yes and that would then that might be an issue for us because if you're not able to recommend uh, an installation that doesn't mean that we should switch to the default in, in installation we should we should use the installation with the git plugin before the git tool chooser is using the exact that same implementation so that we do not break any possible use case that's what i thought with returning git to instead of the string uh, fran and justin do do we have a, uh, why should we use git to do you do you think there's there's a, there's an upside to using git to instead of uh, a string returning a string I mean, I think some of the challenges I had with it is that we have none scattered about the code a little bit. Um, so instead of using that, we could do something like using git tool, which is typed. And then instead of having none, you could potentially have a constant, like there's a pattern called null object pattern. Uh, and what you do is you have an, a kind of a dummy of that type that's, that signifies that, that it's none. In this case that you're representing, if we need to have some kind of null, then maybe you would do something like that. You would have a constant git tool that's like revert to default git tool. And, and then you would use that to determine whether it should be the other one. If you don't need that and you already have access to the default git tool that was already selected, then you have another advantage that you can just send that back potentially. I don't recall if you're, if, at the end of the day, we're sending back a Git tool anyways. And that would be another reason why I would kind of maybe say that we should use a Git tool class if that's the case. Okay. Does that kind it, of make sense? It, it does, Justin. Uh, so if you're not talking, if let's just, if you're ignoring the Git tool here, if you're ignoring this part of the code, the existing, uh, the Git plugin implementation, 
we do not use the Git tool. Uh, the Git tool. We the Git the, this function it internally uses the Git tool, but ultimately we provide the um, the executable path string, and then we directly add it to uh, the uh, client here, the builder of the build builder method for the client. That is how it's it's done right now. But what you're saying is, as I understand that, and I, I, so my only concern is, would I have to update the Git tool class? And I was I was saying that if I was just I was just wondering if 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 that's something we need to do. If it's if it's worth that change, changing the Git tool class to add our case. Where if we do not want to recommend anything, we add a constant. Uh, why would you change the tool class? Maybe I am misunderstanding what you said because I so if so so the case I'm talking about is Justin that if I uh, if I do not want to recommend anything, so the, so the, okay. the Git tool would have the Git tool doesn't as far as I know. It looks for a class, um, either uh, a descriptor, so which could be. So if, if it doesn't have that, if it's null, if we do not provide it, uh, then it, it defaults to the default installation, which is uh, inside the plugin. Now, with that, my concern is that then we are making another decision without considering what the user and before reaching to this point the plugin has made uh, maybe what i can do is that i could possibly uh, i haven't looked at uh, you know i haven't implemented this i i can try uh, instantiating the git tool and then look looking at how this could be done and maybe then we could have a better discussion about how we could use the git tool or should we use the git tool or we should provide a string instead of the git tool yeah, because I guess I don't think you would need to change the Git tool class itself. You would just instantiate, like, if you needed to use the null object pattern. Like, I don't know if I'm not super convinced that that's exactly what you need to do. But if you were needing to do something like that, and I think that's kind of where your concern is of about changing the Git tool class, you would probably just create that const. I, I think you only care about that here. And so if you only care about that here, it mm -hmm. seems like that constant could live here and get SCM, uh, and you would use that to make your decision of whether you're going to go back to the system default. I'm not sure if this is the same where, same place that Fran was going with this. Uh, Fran, when you said you wanted the executable from yes, the Git yes, yes. Tool. Yeah, and then you would just use the executable from the Git tool. Yes, and, and I, I think that seems like the better way to do it. I only did not do it because we were making some custom decision which the Git tool is not equipped to make. But then I, I, I think I should look at the Git tool class first before making that comment. I haven't. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll do one thing. We can discuss this on Friday. I can look at the Git tool class and how we could, uh, if they're not providing any installation, then how we could use the Git tool and then give that um, message to the Git plugin. I think that would be a better way to do this. Um, then I think, um, so another thing I need to do is after doing all of this, uh, parallelly, I need to calculate the time spent on uh, the jobs currently without the Git2 chooser so that after adding the Git2 chooser, we can compare jobs and uh, approximately uh, 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 reach to a conclusion, okay, this is how this performance improvement has worked and to watch. We need some metrics for that and, and those metrics would come from this experiment. Um, so I have enabled the times that I think it's called, I'm not sure what the plugin is called, but it just timestamps that build uh, con uh, the uh, console. Uh, logs and uh, I think I would uh, so what I'm wondering is what kind of use case so what I was assuming was I was taking the lazy path of 
just using marks instance and not worrying about what kind of jobs i want to test here what kind of from which jobs i needed i was i was just i was thinking that to 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 get as to, to get real metrics or close to the, to that point i need to measure jobs which are used in production or some what something like that because if i do this do the same thing with my instance what i would do is i would look at a branch source uh, maybe i would create a multi branch project with a with varying sizes of repository could do that i could do that and i could then see how uh, how the plugin is uh, the performance is changing in the checkout step how it's uh, changing in the scanning process or for the multi branch look at those so there are two ways to do it in in, in what i was saying my approach my default approach was to just install the plugin not ex not first uh, expect from where the performance improvement is going to come and look at jobs with with huge workloads multiple jobs which marks instance uh, uh, contain and then see the difference after adding the git to choose it but i'm not sure if that's the right way to do it or if it's possible because so to see considerable difference we also need to vary sizes of repository i was assuming that one of the project would have jenkins io but i could not see that mark in the in the instance so so what i'm asking here is what approach should I, should i take should i take the approach where i okay i know i have the first area where we could see some improvement is the checkout phase so i should create five projects with varying size of repository and then measure them measure uh, profile them with my jfr in my local instance and then okay i can say that this is the difference in time after the git tool choose it ha has been added and then i could move on to other areas of the plugin for an example the, the sm source the uh, scanning of repositories and then uh, building those repositories i could look at those areas and then um, uh, measure the differences like that so I'm, is, yes i'm i'm not understanding what you gain by using jfr on your local copy the time stamping when I enable it, it looks like it does report it at least to per second resolution. And, and yes. so it does provide second, one second resolution. Uh, let me do a quick check just to see if I change to the JGIT implementation. Does it still timestamp? But I think it does at least well enough to, to see it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that you need to use JFR locally on your environment. Um, no, you're I, welcome I, to create I, I yes. those varying size repository or varying size jobs on the on the the test environment or your local. Either is fine. Wherever wherever it helps you get the data that you want that you need. Okay. Okay. Is so the I, question of yes. like how you can do the the slicing of before and after, or I guess maybe I didn't understand the yes the, under, the, the overall question. I guess. The overall question is how should I, what kind, how should I get the metrics to understand what kind of differences this class is made to the Git plugin? That's the the aim of this experiment, and I would use that in the final uh, presentations and the reports. That's what I'm I'm trying okay. to figure out. And I was actually thinking out loud when I was giving two approaches of doing it. So. Um, I, I guess I would I would default to uh, using I would create different projects with different size of repositories and I would like to do it on Mark's instance instead of my local instance because I am I've seen sometimes that my instance because of uh, because of my personal resource it it um, the the reports are sometimes um, it's it's too varying the reports of um, different builds the same for the same repository for the same configuration the site uh, the uh, the profiling which i do from profiling i've seen that the local instance my local instance adds a lot of variance to those results and i think if we are providing the these results might be important for us because they kind of signify what this project did to the git plugin 
So it, it, the results should at least have some, we should have some confidence in, the, in those results. What, whatever, however smaller increase will be added to the percentage in performance improvement or larger, it just, the, the change doesn't matter, but it matters the results are, we, we have uh, consolidated results. Yeah, yes. so one, one more thing you might do as you're establishing those jobs is intentionally declare them to only execute on agents with the label cloud. That way you're okay. avoiding the wide variability that is exists in the hardware that's behind my, that's on my Jenkins instance. Okay. All the agents that are cloud instances are allocated on Google Cloud Platform. They're the same basic processor type. You'll get different operating systems, but they are the same fundamental processor type. And, and so you'll, you'll, you'll get on average a more common, common throughput result than if you, okay. if accidentally you run on my ancient Raspberry Pi, as opposed to a thoroughly modern new computer running Debian testing or something like that. Okay. Or your Bitcoin miner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Or my Bitcoin miner. That's right. Why didn't I think of that? Because that's something I want to do with my electricity is mine Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have an entire okay. rack of Bitcoin miners and they've all got GPU. No, they, yeah. enough, enough diversion. That's great. Go ahead, Rochelle. Yes. So, um, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll create projects and I'm, that's how I'm going to uh, get the metrics. So from my side, I, I think I've explained what I have to do. Um, from the mentors, we need uh, the Git tool chooser to be reviewed and then I think merged. Um, I, I don't see any blocker in that process. If there is some, please, uh, I, I think that's obvious that it, it will come out in the review process. Uh, I hope I haven't left out anything, uh, uh, Justin, Fran, Omkar, any comments in the PR, which uh, although I, I made sure that I did include each of the suggestion. Only one thing was left. That was uh, Justin and um, Fran's recommendation of using the Git tool instead of the string. That's something we've left. But it's, apart from that, I think we've included everything in that PR. If, if still there's something, I would... Uh, we have to have that review. I think that's it. Um, so on Friday, I would I would try to uh, in so I would should be done by instantiation and uh, and uh, adding the safety check. I'll try to set up the projects and and and, and if we are able to see some results, we'll we'll discuss that if that's possible. So that's, I think that's it for myself. Rishabh, yes, I think uh, last time we discussed one of the point like uh, for the GitLab, you needed the owner's uh, permission level. So I think you missed that point. Uh, so, uh, yep. uh, so, so Umkar, uh, I, yep. yes. Yep. So I, I tried to, to clarify the doubt I had at that time. I tried, mm -hmm. uh, so I used curl to uh, actually, I have a, uh, I I am a I have developer access to a project a private uh, project in GitLab, so I was able to get the size. And so there are varying level of access uh, provided to um, roles in GitLab, okay. and so they range from owner to a reporter. I, and I have a developer's uh, access, and I was able to get the size. So that so maybe I misread the documentation, and that is why I was saying that we need the owner owners. Uh, um, owner's uh, rights to get the size statistics. I think then that's pretty great. That solves one of the issues. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So you basically just need read access to the repo. Basically, right? Justin, yes. Any, any role that has read access should be able to see the statistics. Should. Cool. Agreed, yes, that's perfect. That's what we need. Yes. So thank you everyone for spending more than half, <laughs> half an hour here. It was just 8.30, it's 8.55 now. I'm sorry for taking more time than we were scheduled to. So, uh...